We're going to talk a little bit about how to address a nonlinearity in linear regression. And for simplicity, we're going to stick on the simple linear regression 1x, 1y case. Linear regression requires some assumptions to be met in order to use it, and the most important assumption being linearity. Okay, that the relationship between x and y is linear or can be represented using the line. We have um, separate videos to explore checking the assumptions, um, how we can do that, what the assumptions are, and how we can check them visually. To work through this concept of addressing a nonlinearity, we're going to work with this um, generic xy data here. And you can notice I've made a very exaggerated um, plot here. Right? In real life, you're generally not going to observe data with this nice and neat of a pattern. But I want it to be uh, very clear here so that we can focus on the, the concepts and see how each of these approaches that we're going to talk about work. In linear regression, we're generally going to try and fit a line to describe the relationship between x and y. So if we were to do that, we might end up with a line um, something like this. Now, one thing you notice is that this line isn't going to be a good fit, regardless of if we're looking at a predictive model or an effect size model. Okay, meaning, if we're looking at predictive, where our goal is to use x to try and predict y, this isn't going to work very well. We can see, kind of at this end here, right, for subbing in certain x values, our model is going to over predict the y values. We can see at this range here, right, our model is going to tend to under predict. So for a predictive sense, it's not going to work very well. If instead we're looking at um, an effect size model, where our goal is really to estimate the um, slope and interpret that, again the slope is not really a good, um, the slope of this line is not really a good representation of the relationship between x and y. Right? We can see down here, the slope is actually quite smaller. Right? As x increases, there's not very much change in y. Here, we can see the slope is actually much steeper than this line. Right? As x increases, there's a much more dramatic increase in y. So regardless of if we're looking at a predictive model or an effect size model, if the relationship is not linear, fitting a line is not going to be a good idea. So we're going to look at an overview of some different common approaches to addressing nonlinearities. Um, we're going to talk some talk a bit about some of the pros and cons of each of these approaches. And of course, there's going to be details left to be filled in for each of these. So the first thing that we can try doing is we can try to transform our y variable. And by that, what I mean is rather than working with y, we can try working with, say, for example, the log of y is equal to b0 plus b1x. Okay, an important note here, um, in statistics, when we tend to say log, we mean the natural logarithm, or ln. Okay, it's the most commonly used one, so a statistician tends to say log when they're referring to ln or the natural logarithm. So we can think of, rather than modeling y, trying to model the log of y as a linear function of x's. Or other transformations, like square root of y, or so on. There's different, different ones we can look at, so we'll just stick on the, the log here. If you recall, what logs tend to do is they tend to, the way I like to think of it, is they take these small numbers and kind of stretch out the space there, and the larger numbers, then they kind of squish in the space there. What, what log is doing is essentially taking something, um, moving from a multiplicative scale to an additive scale. Okay, so let me expand on what I mean by that. Consider values of 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. On an additive scale, the distance between each number is growing. Right? There's a distance of 2 between these, then a distance of 4, then 8, then 16, and so on, growing. On a multiplicative scale, they're the same distance apart. Going from 2 to 4 is a doubling. 4 to 8 is a doubling. 8 to 16 is a doubling. Okay, so if you take a look at log of 2, log of 4, log of 8, and so on, the, the log of these values are all going to be equal distances apart. Okay, so I like to think of it as kind of taking the small numbers and stretching out the space, the big numbers, and squishing them in. We won't look at drawing that out here. You're going to try exploring that on your own with um, a set of data if you want. Try looking at x versus y and x versus log of y and see how it changes that shape. Okay, but essentially this approach, what it's going to do is take x, take the log of y, it's going to transform that data in some way, and you're going to try fitting a line through that. 
Okay, so it's doing some transformation on your y variable to try and get back to some linear relationship. There's some pros and cons to doing this. Um, first, um, some of the nice things about transforming your y variable is there's lots of options. So not just the log of y or square root of y, but there's lots of different options of ways you can try and transform y to get yourself um, to having a linear relationship. Another really nice thing about transforming y is one of the other assumptions, which we haven't really talked about yet, one of the other assumptions for linear regression is constant variance or homoscedasticity. It's assuming that variability in y values is roughly the same everywhere. Increasing variance is a common issue where as we progress up the re regression line, variability in y tends to get larger. Transforming y can help address that. Okay, so it, it can address nonlinearities as well as trying to fix increasing or non-constant variance. Some of the kind of negatives of doing um, transforming y is that if you're looking at an effect size model, say where you want to know what effect does your years of experience in a job have on your salary? If we take the square root of y or the log of y, let's just stick on log of y because that's what we've written here. In an effect size model, that slope is going to tell you what effect does every additional year of experience have on the log of your salary. And that doesn't really have any meaningful interpretation. Because essentially you lose some interpretability. If you're in, in a predictive model setting where your goal is just to predict y, it's fine. You can take x, predict the log of y, back transform you know, to get the predicted y value. So really you just kind of lose interpretability in um, effect size models. And I guess another limitation is that these transformations, they can only kind of address certain types of shapes of nonlinearity. They're not um, able to address all nonlinearities. A second option we can think about doing, again involves transformations. We can think about transforming the x variable. So, for example, I'll, I'll stick on the same. We can estimate y using b0 plus b1 times the log of x. Right again, or there's other options. You can use square root of x, x squared, or other, other options. Okay, so you can explore those. Um, one important thing worth noting is that relevant to transforming x or y, there's this idea of a ladder of transformations. And you can explore this on your own if you want. That essentially says if you have a nonlinearity that looks sort of like this, like this, like this, or like this, it gives suggestions for each of those quadrants on transformations you can try on x or y that might help make the relationship look more linear. So for example, what we've got here is something that puts us in that quadrant. And it will give us, okay, the ladder of transformations will give us some suggestions to try and take a nonlinearity that looks like that and make it look more linear. This has pretty similar sets of pros and cons as transforming y. One of the nice things about it is there's lots of different transformations you can try. Um, this, of course, does not fix increasing variability in y. Okay? If there's increasing variability in y, the only way to address that is by doing something to your y variable. The negative, again, is pretty similar. In an effect size model, you lose a bit of interpretability. Right, again, sticking on that example, what effect does years of experience have on your salary? If we take the log of x, our slope, it's gonna tell us you know, what effect does the log of years experience have on salary, which doesn't really have a, a nice, clean interpretation. So what I'd suggest, if you wanna explore these a bit more, get your hands on a data set, some that have different nonlinearities. Try looking at plots of x versus y, log of x versus y, x versus log of y, so on, and see how when you take y versus log of y versus square root of y in these different transformations, um, how it affects the, the shape um, that you see in the scatter plot. Another approach that one can try is using a polynomial or a quadratic. And what this involves is rather than fitting a line, you're gonna fit some quadratic curve to this y hat is b0 plus b1x plus b2x squared. Okay, so model x and x squared. You might want to include higher order terms. You also might want to include x cubed. A reminder, every time you add an additional power, 
what it does is gives you um, an extra inflection point. So including x, x squared, and x cubed is going to allow you to fit something like this, something that has two inflection points. Essentially, let's look at just including x and x squared. What that's going to do is allow us to fit any quadratic okay, or any parabola type shape through this. So we can think of, and in theory, it keeps extending on, okay, although we're really only going to look at it in the range of our data. So I'll just label that here. This is kind of a polynomial or quadratic type approach, right, fitting a bit of a curve to that. Some of the pros of doing something like this is that there's a lot of things in nature that have kind of quadratic or polynomial type growth. So it fits a, a decent amount of scenarios. And again, one of the negatives is that, well, I guess a few of the negatives, you lose interpretability if your goal is to estimate the effect of x on y, right? Because here now, if we did this in that example of looking at the effect of experience on salary, doing this is now going to say, you know, what effect does your years of experience and your years of experience squared have on salary? Right, so you don't really get that good estimate of effect size. If it's just a predictive model, it's fine. If it, if it captures the relationship well, you're good to go. I guess another important note, kind of by getting back to the cons, is that sometimes quadratic curves don't really work that well. Um, I also want to mention before we move on from this, uh, other than kind of special cases, you often don't really want to go beyond x squared or maybe x cubed. Right? There's not a lot of things in real life that have say this is x you know, up to the power of 4, right? They have these sorts of shapes, relationship between x and y. Of course, there's a special case for everything, but quite often, you don't really want to go far beyond x squared or maybe x cubed. So an important note about these first three here that we talked about is that these are um, work well in fixing nice, smooth nonlinearities. So when we see things that have multiplicative or exponential type growth, um, but they don't address all nonlinearities, okay? Only nice, smooth kind of shapes. If we have something that is sort of looking like this, and then it has a quick explosion up and maybe flattens, working with these sorts of transformations or polynomials, well, polynomial actually might capture that one fairly well, but they don't um, capture all nonlinearities, only kind of nice, smooth, quadratic, or multiplicative type ones. A fourth option we can consider is categorizing x, okay, or making it a factor. And it's worth mentioning here that I'm going to introduce this idea here, although it really does require a bit of understanding of how do factors or categorical variables get included in regression models. So you might need to explore a bit on the idea of how factors are included or what is a dummy or an indicator variable. But the idea here is that we're going to model y as a function of the categorized x. Okay. And let's just say, suppose that the way we categorize x is to create categories a, b, c, d, and e. So what we're doing here is, let's use this here. Let's suppose we break this up into, here's category a, b, C, D, and E. Right, so taking this numeric variable and breaking it up into categories. Doing that, the regression model we fit is going to estimate B0 plus XB, the indicator for if someone's in category B, BC times XC, the indicator for if someone's in category C. Can okay, again a reminder, understanding this is going to require understanding what an indicator or dummy variable is. So we do have a video explaining that concept, um, or you can read about it on your own. An indicator for if someone's in category D, and an indicator if someone's in category E. But essentially what this does is the intercept ends up being the um, value for those in category A. So it tells for those in category A, here's their estimated Y value. For those in category B, Here's the estimated y value. For those in C, here's the estimated y. Right, so it calculates the mean within there. For those in category D, what's the mean? And for those in category E, what's the mean? Okay, so you can see this is a little bit of a workaround in that we can kind of create this set of steps. Some of the kind of 
pros of this approach, okay, one really nice thing with categorizing X is that it's super flexible, right? It can set up and down any time that it likes. I guess some of the negatives of this are that you um, lose some information when you categorize. So, for example, here we're saying these were years experience, and just suppose this goes from zero up to five, here's 10, 15, 20, and so on. What we're doing is first we're saying that everyone between five and 10 years experience is now considered the same, right? So we're ignoring this five and six and seven and eight may actually be slightly different, right? We can see that there is a slight increasing trend here. The second kind of loss of information with categorizing, treating everyone between five and 10 the same, but it takes someone who has nine years and someone who has 11 years as being different. And the person with nine years and 11 years experience are probably more similar than the person with five years and nine years. Okay, so there's pros and cons to um, taking something numeric and categorizing it. We gain some stuff, we lose, lose some stuff. Another important point is you have to be careful in choosing the cut points for the categories. Okay, some kind of work does need to go into, do we lump zero to five years together or should we lump zero to 10 years together? If we change where these cut points are, it's gonna change our model slightly. Okay, so pros and cons to each. None of these approaches is universally better than the other. Um, if one of them was universally better than the other, I wouldn't spend time talking about these other approaches. And kind of a fifth one worth mentioning, again, this is really beyond this video and beyond um, a standard intro stats course, but using a nonlinear regression type model. For example, you can explore exactly what this is on your own, the idea of a spline. Essentially, what something like that is, is, um, let me add it in here with orange, and I guess I should indicate this one I drew in the plot with the pink, is it allows you to fit sort of a line that needs to wiggle, okay, it can wiggle anytime it wants. That's the, the very quick explanation of it, okay, but some sort of nonlinear regression model. Um, there's pros and cons to these. One of the nice things, Again, they're really flexible. They can take on any shape, bend any time they like. Some of the cons is they don't have any functional form. Okay, they don't have some nice mathematical function that describes its shape, which means it doesn't have a slope or certain coefficients that can um, give us nice interpretations. So all these different approaches we talked about um, require more details and, and digging into a bit, but this is kind of the big picture overview of some of the common approaches to addressing nonlinearities um, with a lot of the gaps left to be filled in on your own. Thanks for watching our video. Subscribe to our channel. Share our videos. Stick around, guys, because we got lots more.